So you were at the Edward the Seventh School. Yes. Uh, and you, were you being groomed for the university? Did, did well, uh, I suppose everybody's being groomed for university mm. if they're and at any rate, the headmaster said to me, would I like to go to Oxford? And uh, I said, well, I would like to go, but I wasn't going. Because if I went, judging from what had happened to a friend of mine who had gone up to Oxford with a, an open math scholarship for Baleo and a state scholarship, he had a, two, a parent uh, who was the only son, the only child of two teachers who were both earning money and uh, he was costing them money and I said if, if that's what's happening I'd be bound to cost my parents money and it would be bound to diminish my brother's chances so I'm not going to consider going to Oxford instead of that if I live at home. I shall be able to go to Sheffield University and not uh, be a, a drain on anybody, you see. So that's what I decided. Now I found out afterwards that the headmaster probably had the, uh, a lot to do with a thing called the Hasting Exhibition. Uh, he was a fellow of Queen's College and the Hastings exhibition was five years, 125 pounds a year, and uh, it was just more or less designed for people who want to do medicine, you see. And the one who got it that year was somebody who was in the same sets as I was, but he was always in the top third, I was always in the top three. and. Uh, so the headmaster, I think, must have had a lot to do with the recommendation. And he got it, and his father was a GP at Ecclesfield, and uh, he must have gone up. Well, I don't, I lost sight of him then, but if I'd gone when I was, when it was suggested, I should have gone at the same time as uh, Franks, who became Lord Franks, you know. I should have been a contemporary of his and my life would have been entirely different mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been meeting you now for <laughs> at least that's the way I look at it mm -hmm. uh, yes I, I, th I think that's, that's uh, true mm -hmm. that's certainly the way I thought about it at the time and I I went to Sheffield University I had one fault I was rotten at answering examination papers I always seemed to know too much in a way because I always used to devote too much time to one question and not enough time to others for instance, after three years, we had the option of uh, taking a, a BSc, which and the things ran parallel with the medical course, so it didn't shorten your medical course at all to take a BSc. And I took this BSc in physiology. And I remember the final examination, there were four papers, three questions each, three hours, which meant really an hour for each question. And what I did was to uh, spend about two and a half hours on the first question, 25 minutes on the second and five minutes on the third, in every single paper. There were four of us took this physiology uh, course of clinic, uh, you know, at the same time as doing the medical course, so 
it didn't shorten the time we were, didn't lengthen the time we were at the university. And uh, there were two got firsts, and there were two who got second class honours. And uh, the ones who got second class honours, uh, we both got a prize, so called Woodcock Prize, which was a big help. And I also got a scholarship, the Case Scholarship. And the other two only just got their first class honours. So the examiners must have thought there was uh, a bit more to it than uh, I, I could have spent three hours on each question in every exam week. <laughs> so uh, um, you went to Sheffield University yes. in the end. So how, how did you get into university in those days? What was the kind of oh. the process? I got some kind of scholarship. No, I mean, I mean the, these days they have A-levels and GCSEs and, and so on. I, I, I was wondering what the equivalent well, things that you, you we took in those we days. took the school certificate and then the high school certificate. And the high school certificate was the uh, last one and equivalent in many respects to the inter. In fact, it gave you exemption from the inter. It's uh, inter BSc in certain subjects. What, the, what was the inter? The inter intermediate BSc. Right. You see, mm. I got the... Uh, I didn't. I was exempt from uh, intermediate BSc in uh, maths, physics, and chemistry. For mm. Mm. So the, the the higher school certificate. Did you take that in different subjects? Yes. Right. So the, there was a certificate. Yes. You in the school certificate. We, we took uh, history, English, history. French with oral, German with oral, pure mathematics, applied mathematics, uh, you know, that kind of thing. I think there were about eight or nine subjects. And I remember getting a postcard from the headmaster. Uh, I think he sent a postcard to all of us after the school certificate if we passed. And, uh, so congratulations on your school certificate. You have passes with credit in. They gave all all these things to see. It included Latin, fortunately, uh, because I needed Latin later when they were given. <laughs> no, I didn't really need it. I think I thought I might when they were giving me a, an M.A. by decree here. <laughs> of course I had to matriculate first. I went up to the university having uh, got my high school certificate with enough distinction to get me uh, exemption from the inter-BSC except I had to take one or two things. I had to take physical chemistry. What else? Oh, and, uh, zoology and botany. I had to take that uh, because I was not only completing my inter-BSc, I was completing my first MB and uh, taking anatomy and physiology for the first MB, you see, and uh, completing the first MB in the inter BSc and doing a bit of the second MB, all in my first year. It was uh, uh, a program designed for people who wanted to combine a BSc with the medical course. And uh, so I, that's what uh, I did. It was, uh, you know, a bit, a bit uh, hard, but it was extraordinary. It had its repercussions many years afterwards, because in 1973, 
when I was trying to get a job at uh, Newark, New Jersey, I was trying to go there because I wanted to try and see if it was possible to through computers to arrange to collect statistics about all the cancer cases in the world. See, I bet everybody was getting their own computers then and they weren't interested in anything like that. However, uh, they were going to make me a professor at Newark, New Jersey, but one thing they had to know before they could do it was if I'd passed in botany when I was uh, at Sheffield, <laughs> and I had. <laughs> it's very extraordinary to have to think about that then. I don't know what they'd have done if I had passed in botany. Well, at any rate, I I got a scholarship to the Woodcocks. I got the Woodcock Prize, shared with this other chap who got the second, and I got the uh, K Scholarship, which saw, saw me to the end of the medical course. And uh, we continued to be chapel keepers until I was about 22. Now, when did I? I don't know that. These days, I have to get them right, but see, I started doing medicine. I started doing medicine in 24, mm. qualified in 29, so 1922 I'd be about halfway through the course and my parents then gave up chapel keeping, they'd been paying into a fund and they kind of closed, finished off the mortgage, they got a house then and we went to live there and that was a bit nearer the university mm. uh, and uh, it meant the last two years we weren't chapel keeping. So how, how old were you when, when you went up to university? I went up to the university uh, 1924 and right. uh, I went up in September. So you were 19? So, uh, yes. Right. yes. Uh, and I never attempted to play football at the university mm -hmm. because I felt that I couldn't afford Wednesday afternoon as well as Saturday afternoon. Yeah. So I joined the cross country team instead. So, what are your memories of learning medicine at university? Oh, oh I, uh, sorry, I'm wasting time, aren't I? No, it's okay. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I, I just. Uh, Realised, I mean, I got to work hard because I was doing a lot of work, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I just passed the exams all right. Mm -hmm. I I got to the, I, I was uh, afraid of the anatomy because it involved so much memory work, and mm -hmm. I, I didn't think I was very good at memory. I thought I was more good at working things out. Mm. I like physiology a lot less than my anatomy because of that. Mm. And I got a distinction in anatomy and I didn't get more in physiology. <laughs> mm. <laughs> However, uh, oh, I had to write a thesis and I wrote my thesis on the sun secretion of functions of insulin in the animal body. Mm. And this was 
written in uh, 19, oh, uh, 1927, it would be. Mm. And uh, well, it was only a short time before that the Banting invested I decided in writing this thesis was that if it hadn't been for the 1914 war, two Germans would have discovered it instead. And uh, the other thing I remember feeling pleased with was deciding that the pituitary gland was really controlling the other endocrine glands. And the year after I had present my thesis, uh, somebody, some important physician called the pituitary gland the conductor of the endocrine orchestra. I mean the same idea but he put it very much better than I could. Mm -hmm. uh, but I felt uh, really I had the, had the idea at least at the same time as I did probably a bit before. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we started clinical work, of course, and uh, in Sheffield you had to take the third MB, and for us we'd be doing the, you know, compressing the BSC into it it was the hardest exam of the lot because we had to take uh, anatomy and physiology again because they thought powers that we considered that anatomy and physiology would be useful in connection with clinical work to help you to understand the clinical work better and I think that was a damn good idea personally but it meant a lot of work uh, and we had to do pathology and uh, biochemistry and I can't remember everything, public, uh, public health and forensic medicine. So it was uh, the third MB for us was uh, terrific. Uh, and we four people who take the BSC, we realised we had to do a bit of extra work. And we always had a lecture at nine o'clock in the morning, and we used to go straight from the lecture room to the library and work for three quarters of an hour in the library, and then hair up to the hospital and get into the wards at about 5 to 11, see, uh, just before the professor of surgery who called himself, I, he was a, he was very f proud of being the colonel in the army. He was Colonel Connell, Professor Colonel Connell, and we all used to get there just before him. and. Uh, he was to write up the cases and he didn't notice anything wrong. And then one morning when we got there, his house surgeon, who had a peculiar way of speaking, said, the old man wants to see you in his office. He got there early that morning, you see. So we went into his office and said, where have you been? And we said, well, we had a lecture and then we had to, we did, uh, some work in the library and then we came up here to do cases. He said, my addresses should be on the ward as soon as the lecture's finished. I'm not going to sign you up. Well, we had to be signed up, otherwise we couldn't take the finals. And that meant that we'd got to spend the next three months, which was the summer vacation, working was to make sure of not having our finals delayed, you see. And so the two 
who got first decided to go with the comfortable surgeon who uh, well everybody thought he was a nice man and so on but the other two of us well no I was the only one who stayed with C Colonel Connell I thought I'd stay with him and it was jolly good actually because I was there for three months no summer holiday but I was the only student with 80 beds all to myself you see and that meant I saw practically everything and as I saw them I read them up in the book and I found when they came to the final I'd seen practically everything and read about everything two or three times mm. uh, not everything but a lot of things two or three times you see and uh, I, I mean what's more I'd been staying for uh, admissions when we were on emergencies and sometimes staying till two in the morning you see seeing patients uh, dealt with and what's more I've done three appendices and two gallbladders under supervision which was more than registrars did later I mean I had really been trained as a surgeon you see and uh, anyway well it was a, a most valuable time from my point of view and uh, I uh, never regretted it mm -hmm. and then subsequently of course I really had trouble with my eyes first I applied for a job as a government medical officer in San Rhodesia which is now Zimbabwe uh, but I never went because my eyes were sensitive I mean they were sore and running and I got to the stage when going around the patients when I was doing what's called senior medical clocking you know they used to have big windows and a bed between two big windows and then another bed between two more big windows that, that kind of arrangement and it got to the stage when I just couldn't look at the patients because of the effect of the light on my eyes so I was put to bed by the ophthalmic, health, ophthalmic consultant and uh, after two and a half uh, weeks uh, he went on holiday and left his uh, deputy in charge and uh, I, my eyes were reasonably comfortable then the deputy was a self-opinionated Scotsman who came along and uh, was going to change all the treatment you see and uh, but the first thing I knew about it was the nurse brought some ointment along and I could smell it. Ichthyol ointment. I said, if you put that in my eyes, nurse, they'll be worse again. She said, well, Dr. Mackey's prescribed this. I said, well, you'd better ring him up and let him know. Well, Dr. Mackey came down. Uh, he said, Who's in charge, you or me? You see. I said, You are. He said, Well, I prescribed this and therefore you use it. I said, Right. I only thought I ought to mention that it would probably cause a reaction. And so I had the doubtful satisfaction of them having to call him at four o'clock the same morning because my eyes were worse than they'd ever been and uh, another two and a half weeks 
he got them about the stage when the old man had gone away. And um, the old man came along and I said to him, my eyes are sensitive. The important thing is to protect them. And for me to get up and start trying to do something, he said, I agree. And so he prescribed crook's glass with cages round and uh, you know, just various bland things to bathe them with. And then while I was in bed on this third period of recovery, the ophthalmic house surgeon came to me and said, there's a job here, Frank will seal you down to the ground radium officer to the Sheffield National Radium Centre wanted. Previous experience not essential. Some knowledge of maths, chemistry and physics desirable. Some knowledge of French and German desirable. Five uh, salary at the rate of £600 a year with private practice travel for six months at a salary at the rate of £500 a year, travelling expenses paid. And so he said, I should apply for that if I were you. And I said, well, I don't seem to have got much chance. It looks like a consultant job. He said, that's what it is, consultant job. I said, you can't expect to get a consultant job 15 months after qualifying. I said, well, I should apply. And so I applied. I never saw the letters of application because my pupils dilated. I couldn't read. And uh, you can tell how junior I was. I wrote to my schoolmasters for uh, letters of uh, to show how good I was, you see. And uh, the interview was in the same hospital, in the boardroom of the same hospital, and I went to it out of bed, and I had to put on the only suit I'd got, and I was, I'd put on a bit of weight, and so I felt like a trussed turkey in it, and uh, I had to have my hair cut. I remember getting someone from Austin Reeds to come and cut my hair in the... Uh, in the bedroom and uh, then I went for the interview and there was a uh, uh, man trained in surgery, somebody trained in medicine, somebody trained in radiology and me and uh, they gave me the job. Uh, and after that I had to go and uh, serve a month's uh, notice in the hospital before I could start on my travels. Right. So had you had any interest or contacts with radiology before no. that? None at all. Right. That, that was the point. We'd not even had a book on radiology. Mm -hmm. uh, in, even in physics, we hadn't had a book on X-rays. We hadn't had them mentioned at all. Mm -hmm. I knew nothing about them then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to really start from the beginning right. with that. Mm -hmm. At any rate, I decided first of all to go to the Middlesex Hospital for five weeks. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had a month's uh, notice to work off first. and I did that by serving a month as biochemist in a hospital. And there was one good thing about that. Uh, well, there was one peculiar thing about it, first of all. I got there into the lab at five minutes past nine on the first morning, and the senior radiologist was there. He said, you shouldn't be late. I was five minutes late and uh, at any rate one thing I was able to do 
instead of taking about five cubic centimeters of blood from blood sugar, owing to the fact that I'd written my thesis on insulin, knew a lot about blood sugars and so on, I introduced a technique for doing it on a spot of blood. And uh, you know, I started that technique then and it, they were using it five years afterwards. <laughs> so even though I was only there for a month, I, <laughs> had a kind of effect on it. So j that was that the standard technique that became standard or became, everywhere? Well, it, I became standard at the Royal Hospital in Sheffield. Mm. I don't know about other places, right. but it was obviously, what was the name of the people? Man and his wife. I can't remember their names. Mm. I've got the thesis knocking around somewhere. Mm. Uh, however, I did my... Well, one thing I had to do while I was doing the biochemistry was the electrocardiograms. Mm. Uh, they were just sorting. There was a man called Lewis, some hospital in London, had written a book about electrocardiography and I read that and we had a thing about oh, a terrific thing about I should imagine like a mighty bullet's organ you know uh, and uh, glass slides and we did uh, electrocardiographs according to the book that uh, Lewis had uh, published and I was supposed to take these and read them and uh, that was a, an extra on the job of the biochemist and, and then from there I went to the Middlesex Hospital and uh, in the Middlesex Hospital there was Professor Russ who was on the National Physical, no, what National, what's it called? Well, oh dear. At any rate, he was on the National Radium Commission. He was on the National Radium Commission. And he, he had a, uh, a second in command who was very concerned with secondary radiation from uh, radium gamma rays, you see. And so I learnt a lot of physics from him, but he didn't understand about the secondary radiation, and so I didn't either. But uh, I got good grasp of the physics and what's more I saw the kind of things they were doing in the theatre that kind of thing at the Middlesex Hospital at the same time a chap called Brian Windier an Australian with an FRCS had been appointed there and he at the time I got I was there was in Paris uh, at the Fondation Curie, learning what they could tell him. So I didn't meet him there, and I just uh, was learning what they were doing. And I remember, this is one thing I definitely heard, house surgeon said to the surgeon, you've got a cancer of the tongue to put radium into this afternoon, sir. How much radium should I order? And he said, lots, laddie, lots. I, <laughs> I <laughs> wasn't very, very scientific at that stage and I went from there to Brussels and in Brussels there was a, I went to Brussels because Professor Murdoch from Brussels, fancy Murdoch, it was a Scottish name but he was a, a Belgian 
sorry, I think that was a hangover from the First World War. And uh, at any rate, he'd given a lecture to the local medical society, and I'd heard it, and it sounded as if they knew what they were doing. And there was a physicist there who'd been at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. And uh, so I thought the physics would be very sound, you see. And uh, I went there and spent five weeks there. And uh, I learned about getting a uniform dose from the distribution of things and used to sit up with all the hours practicing it. And uh, then after five weeks I thought I'd got enough there and I'd written to Stockholm and arranged to go there. And I, on the 1st of May, uh, 1st of January 1931, I went to Stockholm from Brussels. Uh, no, that, that's wrong, I think. No, it was it was the first of January, nineteen thirty-one. That's right. And uh, I went by train, and I had a, a language uh, thing from Berlitz, and was trying to learn Swedish on the way. <laughs> in the train and uh, the train and then the ferry and then the train to Stockholm and uh, the railway station had a marvellous restaurant there and very attractive and I went in there to have some breakfast and uh, the waitress came along and uh, asked me what I wanted and in my best Swedish I asked for two eggs and uh, she burst into a lot of Swedish, which I didn't understand. And so my next thing was to ask for the manager. And so she went away. And when she came back, she brought the manager. But in the meantime, I'd seen a big fat Swede, I assumed it was a Swede, go to a table, which was in the middle of the room, and uh, go round it with a plate, take the plate back, get another plate and go round it again. And I thought, well, it seems as if that might be the kind of thing I ought to do. So I got a plate, I went round it once and brought the plate back. And just as I got the plate back, the girl came back with the manager, who was just tying his tie as if he'd only just got up. And uh, he asked me in perfect English what was the trouble. And so I told him I'd uh, asked for two eggs, but that was about the limit of my Swedish. And he said, yes, well, uh, she didn't understand. I said, but since then, I've seen what happened and I've just been round and got this. Smuggers bought it, called, he said. I, say, I said, is that what it is? He said, yes. I said, that's what you should have done. I said, I've done the right thing. He said, yes. I said, I don't want any eggs. <laughs> and uh, that was that. And then I went from there to uh, Radium Hebert, which means the home of radium, because uh, Henry, Professor, you know, uh, this is terrible, I'm forgetting even their names. Heyman, H-E-Y-M-A-N. He, his method of treating cancer of the cervix uteri was what they were using in Sheffield. However, I went to Radium Hebert try and see Prof President he uh, Professor Heyman. Uh, Rodium Hammett was a house and uh, it means the home of radium. They did all the radium <coughs> work there. They, were, they had plans then for building a new hospital, the Karolinska Hospital, mm -hmm. and that was built soon after I been to Stockholm. <coughs> uh, and it was built to 
logic stepped uh, for radium work and then added to for other things and it's still in existence as a, uh, the big hospital in Stockholm and uh, at any rate I went and asked to see Professor, Professor Heyman and uh, they gave him me the number of his room and I went and I knocked on the door and he opened the door. He had a most delightful smile and he could speak English perfectly and uh, he asked me to come here and we talked for a time and then he said, I wonder if you would do me the favour of uh, editing this. It's uh, an article that I've written in English and uh, I'd like the English to be correct. So I said, certainly. And I took it and I said, uh, can you recommend a hotel? So he recommended a hotel, a hotel for Yaris Sighton. And I walked there because it was quite close. And when I got there, I lost his article. I <coughs> I heard back straight away when knocked on his door he opened the door and he said is this what you're looking for? <laughs> it had dropped almost in the hospital you see mm -hmm. so it was all right to tell me. we got on very well <laughs> uh, and well, I got on. I learnt a lot in Stockholm. There was a physicist called Siebert. There's a unit called after him now. Uh, and uh, they they were very closely associated with the Swedish government. They had a scheme by which all the patients treated by at the radium hammers were brought back at least once a year to radio hammers government's expense. You see, I mean, it, they considered it very important. Now, one thing they did: they used radium that was four times as strong. I mean if, for instance, in one and a half centimetres the radium that we used in Sheffield had one milligram, they would have four milligrams in the same thing. And uh, I think it was too much because the chief One of the men called Ellis Bervin. Ellis was his first name and Bervin, B-E-R-V-E-N, was his surname. They both died of cancer. One died of leukemia and Bervin died of melanoma. Uh, and, uh, but they knew their stuff. And Bevan just got his uh, doctorate. I don't know quite uh, what that meant actually, but it did mean him having a kind of party. And they had a party at, uh, at the Gilda uh, Freighton, which means the Golden Peace which was a restaurant tended to be frequented by poets and things. At any rate, he had to party there. And uh, I went, but I didn't drink anything. And I had a feeling they were a bit disappointed that I didn't drink anything. And uh, then there was a, I was invited later to another party at the same place. And because I felt they'd been a bit disappointed before, I felt I'd uh, 
drink. I did. I just uh, took everything he provided. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, in the middle of winter, it was very cold, and uh, everybody who went to that party had a cold. Afterwards, they walked out into the open air. They probably felt warm, but they got a cold. I got a cold. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I do remember feeling a little unsteady on the way back to my hotel. And uh, otherwise, there was nothing to notice except that usually I folded my clothes up and put them all in one place and so on where I should be able to get them quickly and easily and uh, on this particular occasion I just dumped them. <laughs> so that was the only thing I noticed. So I decided at least I I could take it, but uh, I didn't make a habit of it. So did you go anywhere else on your what? tour? What? So did you go anywhere else on your tour? That was well, I uh, I was uh, interested in. The secondary radiation from the platinum, uh, the needles, which one physicist working under CVET had uh, spent all his time measuring. You see. So, what is secondary radiation then? Well, <coughs> as the gamma radiation comes through the platinum, you see. Mm -hmm. A certain amount of it is absorbed. Right. Some of it gets through. But what's absorbed can give rise to secondary electrons. Right. And uh, there was <laughs> a, a little sequel to that. Later, I'll tell you about uh, later about a, a course I went to in England before I actually started work in Sheffield and uh, the pundit, the radio pundit in England was Sir Stanford Cage and he was giving us a lecture and he was telling us why three, three milligram needles which are uh, six centimetres long were had 0.6 millimetres of platinum instead of 0.5 he said that extra 0.1 millimetre of platinum filters off the last of the single beta radiation and so I often contradicted it more or less and uh, and that was something for an absolute tyro to contradict the one who'd written a book about it. But uh, he was wrong, and he uh, offered me a ride back to London afterwards in his Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. so, well, so he, he forgave me, and we became quite friends. Mm. Uh, in uh, at a conference, for instance, subsequently in Zurich, he and I sat next to each other, and he could tra tell me what people were talking about in French or German. I knew some French and German, but not enough to understand it completely. You see, mm. and. Uh, well, he was a, a Russian originally, and he knew French and German and English. And mm. Russian, of course. Uh, he had known Italian as well for a while, I knew. Mm. 
but uh, we became quite friendly. Mm. So that happened about the same time as you were doing your tour? Well, I went from, uh, uh, I mean, the, you know, I, I, uh, I got on quite well with the people, mm. and the night before I left we had a, a party, we uh, went out into the woods with uh, torches and uh, uh, had a shindig, put all the torches together and roasted potatoes and things and then walked back in the dark and, uh, and that one girl and I got quite friendly but uh, uh, that was that and then uh, I uh, went the next day to Germany, to Hamburg, and uh, there there was a man called uh, Holtusen, and Holtusen was a great man I thought, and he had a flourishing centre with several people working with him and I spent a month there and, uh, no about three weeks there and uh, enjoyed it and learnt a lot and uh, there was a man there who had done a lot of work on the erythema reaction quantitatively you see mm. and I was interested in these things quantitatively very considerably to relate the actual dose in known units to the reaction you see. Mm. What's, what's the erythema reaction? What? What's the erythema? Erythema is threatening. Oh right. Mm -hmm. You see and uh, you could uh, know I mean up to them people were talking about erythema doses mm. but there had been a, a conference in Stockholm in 1928 and there they decided on the Röntgen as the unit for radiation and the Röntgen uh, was a bad unit really because it was a unit of both exposure and absorption. Mm. You see, they're very different. And uh, uh, however, it was a unit that things could be quantified in. And uh, th this man, uh, I forgot his name, was uh, quantifying the erythema dose and so on. Uh, then I went from there. Uh, there is a, a sequel to that, so much of fact. There were about four or five people I met in Hamburg, and subsequently in 
and uh, would, be, would that be right? No, I've got it wrong, haven't I? Hmm, yes, it wouldn't be the Nazis in 1915. Yeah. Uh, it's the date I've got wrong. Right, it would be 1930-something. Yes, it would be, I think it was 1937. Right, that, yes, that makes sense. Yes. And I went across the Atlantic in the Queen Mary in 1937. Uh, with two chaps, one from Manchester, one from Newcastle. Uh, one from Manchester was called... One from Newcastle was called Thurgo, I knew that. Well, all the things.
shorter, you know, mm. the Grand Canyon, because it was early in the morning, and uh, I got Nuttall to go down with me for the first half mile, and then to bring my camera back, because I was wanting to go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and he didn't want to go, was in no condition to go. Mm. And uh, I, uh, I've been travelling in trains for about three weeks instead of uh, being active, but uh, I was looking forward to going to uh, going down the Grand Canyon, and I went down the Grand Canyon. You know, it's one mile deep, mm. and it's eight miles distance, and. Uh, I got to the bottom and I thought there'd be some kind of cafe or something, but there wasn't. I met a, a mule trip being led by a cowboy and I just said to him, is there any chance of any food down here? He just said, no. I found afterwards that he charged you something like 15 or 20 dollars for bringing you up again if you got lost. And so <coughs> that was that. And uh, I, I did get one foot by mistake in the actual river. And uh, I thought it looked muddy, so I didn't have any, I didn't drink out of it because I didn't fancy it. And uh, subsequently, when I brushed my trousers a day or two later, I found that turnip was full of sand. There was no sand in the other one, so I must have picked that up out of the river. And it wasn't just mud, it was sand, as you see. However, I walked back again and it was, uh, you know, uh, had its difficulties, because before I got to the top I was uh, feeling thirsty. Halfway up there was a there was an actual pipe with a tap, but there was no water because the pipe was broken. And uh, before I got to the top, I was chewing grass to try and get some moisture. And that was unpleasant because it was gritty. <laughs> and I got to the Bright Angel Hotel. And there, I, I mean, time was limited because you know, we planned a, a trip and it depended on catching a train out of uh, there, which was the top of the Bright Angel Trail, and it, we had to catch a train out of there about six o'clock or so. So I had to get there before six o'clock, and I got there in time to have some tea, and I asked for some tea at a the hotel there, there was only one hotel of course, and they brought me tea in a teapot, almost unheard of in America, and uh, I had 12 cups of tea after that, I felt all right. <laughs> and, uh, and then we went along to Buffalo, and not into, would it be Denver? No, Denver's on place beginning with D. Um, Detroit, Dallas. Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. And uh, then from there to Canada, Ottawa, so on, Montreal. Then from Montreal, we took the train disconnectedly, then to New York and then came back on the Britannic, which was a motor, a motor vessel. And uh, then, subsequently, I went to Hamburg again. to, well, I think 
think I was wanting X-ray tubes. I left Sheffield in 1943. So I wouldn't be there because the war didn't finish to 45. Tell me about the, these, the platinum needles that you what? mentioned. The platinum needles. You mentioned. Yes. How do they work? Do you... you oh, well... Uh, the... Uh, the needles we used in Sheffield mm. were obtained through the National Radium Commission mm. and the National Radium Commission had needles made similar to what they were used in Paris mm. and they consist of platinum needles with a point about 0.7 centimetres centimetres or millimetres Point uh, Wait a minute. Uh, the total length was 2.5 centimetres. Mm -hmm. And so the cell inside containing the radium was 1.5 centimetres. Mm -hmm. And that would allow for 0.7 centimetre one end. Wouldn't it? That would make 2.2. Point six at the other end, that kind of thing. Right, so they're hollow yes, needles. It's a hollow needle yeah. and the total filtration mm -hmm. of the radium was 0.1 of a millimeter in the cell that was put into 0.4 of a millimeter the thickness of the needle right. into which it was put, you mm -hmm. see. And uh, so the filtration total filtration 0.5 millimetres of platinum, except for these longer ones which were produced that were 6 centimetres long and they had three of these cells totaling 4.5 centimetres and total length was 6 centimetres so that there'd be 4.5 with about 0.7 here and about 0.8 at the other end. So the, the cells have the actual radium inside, is that what? right? The cells have the radium inside? Yes, and each, each one, uh, each one had one milligram of radium mm. in a 1.5 centimetre length. Yeah. You see? Yeah. And, uh, so the total uh, content mm. of these needles, which were six centimetres long, mm. was three milligrams. Right. So what does radium actually look like? I've never seen any. Oh, right, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, it, uh, it uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, a metal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, in the same chemical group as uh, barium, mm. uh, strontium, strontium, barium, mm. uh, strontium, calcium, uh, yeah. calcium, barium, yeah. and before the strontium, there's lithium. Yeah. Yes. Right. Was it li li lithium, sodium, potassium? Is it? No. Is it? That's a different group. Second group. Yeah. You see, yeah. Uh, is lithium in the first? No, li lithium, I think, is in the first group with is it? So, um, sodium and potassium. Well, it's lithium, potassium, sodium, rubidium, cesium. Mm. Yes, I can't remember what's calcium for calcium. Uh, Never mind. <laughs> we, 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 we can look it up sort of some, yeah. sometime. Yeah. So the needles, the, the cells come pre pre prepared. Oh yes. Right, and you just kind of. Yes, must. there are two ways. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's cheering up. I thought. Mm. Uh, 
there are two ways sucking off the gas mm. the radon gas mm. which is also a gamma radiator mm. and using the radium right well uh, the point about using the radon gas is the, if that was put in mm. it de 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 degenerated and became inactive mm. eventually mm. whereas the radium take 1500 years to get down to half its strength right you see so practically speaking it doesn't become inactive at all right so you, so you use the needles over and over again over and over again right yes. okay but the radon you can put in and leave yeah and uh, uh, I personally liked uh, the radium needles mm. which you could put in and take out again right um, is there an active part of the needle. What? Is there an active part of the needle where the radiation oh, comes the, out? The, ra the radium. Um, have we got a... Well, I'm, I'm drawing this. Mm. So this is a needle with three cells in. This was needed with three cells, right, okay. but uh, the, the cells were all the same size, of yeah, course. Yeah. And the, the radi radium is in here. Yeah, in, in, much in the middle of the and cell. The radiation is coming out in all directions, mm. but the only thing that matters is what comes out here, because what goes out there is uh, much diminished, you see. Right, because so there's such, so much more platinum there. At the ends of needles. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And there. Mm. So, so it's this. This right. is. So it comes out the whole for the whole length of the needle. Yes. The, right. In all directions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, and 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 you 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 put the needle into the part of the body that yes. needs, needs the treatment. Yes. Supposing. Uh, have a patient with a cancer of the tongue. Yeah. And yes, I'll just draw the tongue. Yeah. And I would say the cancer of the tongue is there. Yeah. Looked at this way. This is the tongue. Mm -hmm. That's the epiglottis. Yeah. And the cancer's here, you see. Yeah. And uh, we probably put needles in like this. And, uh, right. So, and uh, a bit here just to make up yeah. the fact that it's uh, away from the radium. You see. Right. So you, you would just lay the needle on the surface of no, the tongue. No, stick them in. Stick them in from where then? From from the. Well, you have the patient under an anaesthetic. Right. So through the neck or no, through the through the mouth. Uh, through the mouth. Yes. Okay. Right. You see that? Yeah. And that'd be, yeah, but you, the needle actually could go into the tongue. Into the tongue itself, yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's. Uh, and uh, well, there's one case that Herman Suit. Is that? I never know which is the chair and what's. I think it's the chair still. Uh, there was a patient with a carcinoma with a soft palate mm. uh, and uh, it was like this. That was cancer mm. and it had eaten away a lot of the palate. Mm. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the still swollen. That's the top of the mouth. Yeah. yeah. And the, the surgeon sent the patient to me and said could I give him some treatment mm. uh, and he hoped then that he'd not be able to, not have to excise too much of the palate, mm. but the patient would still have to be fed mm. with a tube. Mm. And uh, instead of doing as he said, what I did was to put in a radioactive wire, right? radioactive isotope, you yeah. see. Yeah and uh, worked out the dose and uh, cleared it up and the patient
patient was able to swallow afterwards. His palate was sufficiently intact mm -hmm. for him to be able to swallow right. without having to be fed through a tube. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Suit, who, 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 from America, who went back to America and then became a professor at Harvard, is now retired from there, came to see me fortnight ago as much a fight with his wife. Mm -hmm. But he's always, he always talks about this because he was there when I did it. Mm -hmm. And you see, the snag is that, uh, I mean, in doing a thing like that, I, uh, I read it with my own fingers a bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I don't think, I mean, I did such a lot of uh, mm -hmm. radium work that Mm. It wasn't just this case that mm. that. Mm. And uh, at any rate, it, uh, as far as that patient was concerned, mm. it was a good lot, a good, a good result because he was able yeah. to swallow. Yeah. So the needles, did you, in, you know, these needles pla pla you take out again? Right, but did you place them with, by hand, or did you? Add oh, we have a faucet. So they were guiding the yes. the, the business end. Mm. And uh, I think uh, nowadays everybody's so afraid mm. of of it that uh, they don't like doing it this way. Mm. But uh, yeah. well, can I, can I take a picture of your your yeah. pan just to show the um, yes the effect? I get my camera again. 